Well, my name is Randy Buechler. Uh, we're at Shady Grove Farm UP in Gwynn, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula. And this is a small permaculture farm that we have slowly grown over the last almost 19 years. We primarily do this to produce organic food for our family and, and our community. You know, what Earthwork Harvest Gathering does and what, what Seth and the team of people have created is a, it's an incredible community building event. You know, it's called a gathering, it's not a festival. It's a gathering and when you go there, it feels like family. Um, so it's a really good avenue to try to, I think one of the most important parts of my job as a farmer is to build bridges between people and food. You know, because there is a huge disconnect. So to be able to, to bridge that gap between people and food, I think is crucial in creating these local food systems and keeping them sustainable because as we've seen this year with this pandemic, um, what did people do when there was a food shortage or an alleged food shortage that was about to come? People, I'll say panicked. I think a lot of people did. Um, I'll never understand why they went to the toilet paper, but you know, they, uh, when people panicked a little bit, they all of a sudden meat was disappearing off the shelves and you know, certain food items were gone. You know, you couldn't go to the grocery store and get certain things from what I was told. I didn't have to worry about it because I have a small farm. You know, I was asked by Earthwork Harvest Gathering if I was interested in, in doing a virtual workshop for the virtual harvest gathering. I mean, in my mind, I was, oh yeah, I need to do that. It's an education, it's an opportunity for me to educate people on something I really believe in. And one of the things I do here is I try to teach people. And every year when I do animal harvests, I invite people to come and join me. Number one, it's always good to have more hands because that makes getting through the day and the processing part of it quicker and easier. But it's also, every year I get new people that haven't learned how to process chickens yet or harvest chickens. And so I had a, had a pretty good crew this year. You know, I think we had a total of eight or 10 people, enough people to where I could have people rotating uh, to, to experience a little bit of all, all steps. And, you know, so it starts out where, you know, the chickens are still down in their pen um, and we only bring back eight chickens at a time because that's how many kill cones that I have on my stainless steel stand where, you put the chickens in, um, then, you know, the, after they sit there for a minute, you know, their heads are down. It kind of calms them down a little bit. Um, and then, you know, you pull their heads down and I, some people will just cut the throat uh, to make them bleed out. I just take the head right off to save that step later. And then the blood gets caught into the basin underneath. And, uh, you know, I then use all that blood and I put it back into my compost piles and then I have blood meal. Um, you know, so we, we do that and then, you know, the next step is that they, they go into this scalder. Uh, it's another piece of equipment that I have where it's thermostatically controlled. You have to have the right temperature of water and you dip the chickens into the scalding water. It's about 160 degrees, 150 degrees for broiler chickens and uh, you have to be careful you don't do it too long. But what that does is it releases the feathers in the skin. So when they go into the next stage, which is the plucker, the feathers come out easily as the this plucker spins around. Um, if you scald them too long, the skin can rip. If you don't scald them long enough, the feathers don't come out easily. Um, you know, so those three steps right there, like when people see that at first, you know, it seems kind of gruesome because you're, you're taking the heads off of chickens and there's blood squirting and the chickens are kicking and you know, their bodies are shutting down. Like you just completely interrupted their nervous system and, and electrically they're freaking out. And, you know, the first time I saw it, I was like, holy crap, you know, that's pretty intense. And it is. The thing to gain from that is that's the reality of eating chickens. They have to die in order for you to eat them. And it's not a pretty thing, but it's a necessary step if we're going to eat chicken. Um, you know, the chickens in the grocery stores don't just magically appear off of a semi. They too were once alive, but lived a borderline horrific life uh, in an environment where perhaps they weren't even outside ever. Um, but then anyway, after the, the harvest of the chickens and the scalding and the plucking, the next part is now you've got to eviscerate them, which means you have to get the insides out. And that's a step, you know, I, I don't ever ask people to take the heads off the chickens. I do that every time. 
I will allow somebody to do it if they want to learn that step. Most people just want to watch. Um, but then when you get to the evisceration part, people tend to be a little bit uncomfortable with that too because now you're cutting the chicken open and you have to pull the insides out. Um, but I always go through each step and I, I show people exactly how I do it here. There's several ways to do things. Um, but you know, I'll go through each step and I'll pull out all the innards and I teach everybody what all the organs are and what we do with all the organ meats. And then we have you know, five gallon buckets to where anything that we don't use, we'll put in the five gallon buckets and either that gets fed to our pigs or goes into our compost piles and the compost piles eat it up and make our compost piles much richer. So then we then use all of that the next season and add compost and amend all of our growing areas. Um, so we have zero waste animal harvests in that regard as well. Um, so, you know, every, every year when I do it, it is a, it's a in-person workshop here. And this year it just happens to be a virtual workshop due to recording the actual workshop. I think I had half people, half the people were new and, and half the people had some experience and, and uh, everybody walked away with, I think, feeling really fulfilled at the end of the day. And, and I hope that's the same that happens with this virtual workshop, even though it's not hands-on. You know, when, when Harvest Gallery reached out to me about doing a workshop, I was like, yeah. you know, I'm harvesting chickens anyway. And I can't say no to trying to teach people about what we do and the importance of doing what we do. And, and it's Earthwork Harvest Gathering and Seth Bernard's a super good friend of mine, you know, and so is Bob Bernard and Mayor Irla and all of them. And, uh, so yeah, I, through you guys helping me do this, I, we get to help them do their thing. And then through all of it, we get to help all kinds of people. Collaboration. Yeah. And you can all watch so you can see how I do it and how I prefer our chickens to be when they're done. You're all gonna have your own little tricks and shit that you do. Um, Kristen's done it a whole bunch here. You've harvested quite a few chickens out of gyms, hey? Yeah, Scott's done a bunch. Um, I don't know who else has experience doing it, but. Um, harvesting chickens is not an enjoyable thing. It's it's a necessary thing. And I don't like the words getting enough used together, as you guys know, and so we'll just try to do it well, but. A lot of farmers grow their own meat. Most farmers don't process their own. Um, a lot of people do their own chickens, but uh, the hardest part is taking the lives of the animals. And, but like, a, yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, I treat my animals well. And, I mean, I, we interact every day multiple times. So it's always, it's always a hard thing, but I, like I tell people, if it ever becomes easy, I don't want to do it. It should be hard, it should be emotional. You know, and if you don't experience that when you're taking the life of your farm animals, then something's off somewhere in my opinion. I don't think that's how we should. If we're going to eat meat, we should have that emotional roller coaster that comes along with this part. On average, I usually end up with four to five pound chickens when they're dressed out. If I was to grow the Cornish cross chickens for as long as I grow these Freedom Rangers, I would have 
small turkeys. They would get to be 12 pounds probably. Yeah. Been in them longer. Second process with the right water temp. And then I always, always do a check. Well, those are coming out pretty easy. Uh, there's always some pin feathers and stuff that you have to that, that lag behind that you've got to deal with. And this is typically why I have always have to hand pick some. When the, when the chickens are on the tables being eviscerated and stuff, like it's also a time for quality control and picking any other feathers that you might see because none of us are perfect. Still can't imagine doing this the whole bird by hand. I know. The first time I ever did it, that's how we did it. Like with a turkey fryer burner and a turkey fryer pot. Mm -hmm. Filled it with water, hand dunked each chicken, and then Can hand you imagine before they realize like you should put them in super. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so if you guys want to come around, whoever needs to see, I'll show you my preferred method. A few last little feathers. So the first thing we do is to take the feet off. And you can see there's like a double knuckle here. It's where the, the foot goes into the, the joint on the end of the drumstick. Um, if you put pressure down, you just start cutting. It just naturally comes apart at that joint. So you can see. And then we'll save the feet. And if you do it with finesse versus forced pressure, it's gonna be much easier on the knife blades. Um, so once I have that done, I turn the chicken like this and there's so chickens don't have teeth, they have a crop in their neck, which is where all the feed goes first when they eat, and then that'll bulge up. And the first time I ever saw that, I thought there was something wrong with my chickens because I didn't know much about chickens. Um, but the crop fills up with feed and then it goes down into the gizzard. And the gizzard is where that, that acts as the chicken's teeth. They pick up little stones and gravel and stuff like that, and that's what grinds up their food. Um, so I'll show you that when we get in there. But the first thing I do in order to get the crop out all the way is I make a little cut in the skin because the crop is really connected. I make a cut in the skin and then I pull the neck up through. And you have to use your fingers to disconnect some things on occasion. And when I do that, I then, so here, here's the trachea tube as well. Um, so when I do that, I take my knife along the bottom of the neck and I cut straight down. And what that does is it releases the top of the crop so that when we're pulling, when we're eviscerating and pulling the, the guts and stuff out, the crop will hopefully come with it. Um, it's one of the hardest things to get out, right? Yeah. And then any of this slop, we call this gack, chicken gack, goes in the gack buckets. The gack buckets end up getting fed to the pigs. What the pigs don't eat ends up becoming part of the soil part of the compost. The compost becomes part of the soil. So it's zero waste animal harvests every time we do this. Um, and then we always shorten the necks. It's way easier for packaging. So we'll make a cut through the bone, final cut with the knife. Necks, hearts, and livers all go in one bowl. Gizzards go in one, feet go in another. So now that we have the neck off, the feet off, come down here just above their butt you can see their their bones here um, obviously you can't cut in there so I pull the skin out and I cut just above these bones and the reason I do that is because when you're baking a chicken if you can leave this flap of skin here it acts as a cover for the cavity and it'll retain moisture so I'll make a slit here you don't want to cut in too far because you'll start cutting things you don't want to cut but then I try to separate a little bit, but with my hands. And the first thing that we're gonna see in here is the gizzard. So if you can see this, 
right here is the gizzard. The gizzard will act as a handle. Everything is connected to it. Um, so you have to pull firmly, but not extra hard to where you break stuff. It never fails, you end up breaking stuff. Um, it usually requires a couple different pulls. See, there's a piece of gravel now, part of the liver. So I got the gizzard out. I'm gonna go back in and, and grab more. So here's the liver, really nice dark colored liver. It's like science class. Yeah. So all of that comes out, all connected. Gizzard, here's the liver. Here's the gallbladder. You do not want to cut that. And if you cut it and it gets on any part of the meat or the cutting board, it can spoil the meat. If it gets on the cutting board, you immediately just want to stop, get your cutting board cleaned off because it'll contaminate stuff. Um, so normally I'll just cut the liver, set it off to the side, and then I'll deal with that in a minute. Right now we've got to deal with the intestines. Um, so obviously this is connected to the butt. Um, so those two bones that I showed you in the beginning that we had to cut above, I put this off to the side and I cut just on the inside of that down to the side of the butthole. And then I put that in that first cut and get it out of the way because you don't want to cut that. And I do the same on the other side. And then there's a little bit more connection here that you have to release. And then I cut behind it. the digestive system and then I'll cut that off the gizzard gizzards go in a separate bowl and we end up cleaning these like so these go in a separate bowl because you have to process the gizzards like this this is full of gravel um, totally full of gravel and I, I can show you that later this goes in the pig bucket and now we're at a point of there's still more to get but if you look in there the two big white things you see are chicken testicles. Yep. And then we still have the trachea. Um, there's lungs in there. We have to do a finger sweep for the lungs. I leave the kidneys in. Those are just along the spine of the chicken. I leave them in because they're edible. You could leave the testicles in too um, and bake them and eat them like organs. And you can tell that these are older chickens because those are big. <laughs> like younger six, eight week old chickens wouldn't have big balls like that. So now, here's the, the bottom end of the crop that I cut off in the neck in the beginning. And this came obviously disconnected from that when I was pulling. That's what I'm saying, the crop is super connected up in here. So if you do that first step that I did on the neck, it'll make it much easier. And this acts as a handle. And then you just have to slowly work it. You don't want to pull everything super hard or else things come apart. And that's the top of the crop. That is the crop. So this is the part that fills up with feed when they eat. And then it works its way down. This is, this is connected to the gizzard. It goes into the gizzard, gets chewed up. So this, this is a pretty, pretty cool thing. It's big. And it, it can totally balloon up. Did you not feed them for a while before this? Is that what So, we're... yep. Today's Saturday. What's the day? Sunday. Sunday. Um, yeah, so yesterday they did not get any food. Okay. I, I don't feed them for at least 24 hours prior to harvest, which keeps the digestive tract cleaner. Um, so now I'm getting the heart. So the heart typically has a sack around it, which came off when I was pulling it out. Um, pericardium, it's called. I learned that uh, really well with, with my heart surgery. So I cut the top of that off, and then we'll put this into the edible organ meats. And 
I'll put that into the edible pig bucket. So then I do one last look in here to make sure I got everything out of the way, and I did. So now if you look inside, you can see bright pink on both sides. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Those are the lungs. Mm. Those are really tricky to get out if you've never done it because they're like right on top of the ribs. The ribs can be sharp. So you end up doing a finger sweep on the lungs. And you can get in there and you'll feel like, I take my hand in and I'll go like this and you can get your fingers in between the ribs. Um, yeah, you have to have eyeballs on your fingertips. That's one of the reasons I like harvesting big animals more because you can see. So there's one full lung. And it's not a huge deal if you don't get all of the lung out. Um, again, it's another organ that we could just leave in there and eat. I've, I've eaten all of this stuff. And I'm still here to talk about it. <laughs> Favorite organ? Uh, I prefer the livers. Um, I think the chicken livers are by far one of my favorite. And for people that, they would eat liver, but it's a, like a, really strong liver thing for them that turns them off. Chicken livers don't have that near as much as like a pig liver or a sheep liver or a cow liver. So now I have all the organs out. The cavity looks clean. Um, the one thing I'm missing is this trach tube right here. So it's really hard to get a hold of. It's, it's like a slimy, slippery thing to pull out this way. So I always push it through with my finger and then grab it from the inside. And there's the rest of the trachea. And these things are hard and weird. Um, I always, I always think when I, whenever I pull one of these out, I always think they would make really good fishing bait. <laughs> so that's that and then the final thing to do is once you once you know you have like and i recommend for everybody the first time you do it keep all your organs and everything out on the cutting board so that you can just do a quick double take and like okay two lungs two balls trachea um i don't remember what that's called you should know that Thing. Yeah. It's like an olive. It is. Yeah, it's a chicken olive. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that way you can just do an inventory and make sure you have everything out. And then the last thing is a rinse. It might be spleen. Oh yeah, probably. Yeah. You can see how that skin flap, you know, so really when it's sitting on a baking dish, the pressure of this being pushed up, it'll, you'll have a closed cavity, you know, so if you were to stuff it or whatever, it just helps keep moisture in. A lot of people will cut up here and remove all that skin, but like, again, like I told you earlier, this is my way of doing it. There's so many ways you can do it. Personal preference. Then they go in ice water. They sit there until we're all done and ready to package. All right, so I can show you real quick on how to take apart a gizzard. Oh yeah, we gotta get the... gap off the little bear. So this is a... It's okay to sacrifice some liver to get rid of that. Mm. 
So good liver. And I take that. I sacrificed a little bit of liver because I'd rather do that than to get that content all over the cutting board or the chicken or the liver. And before I do that, I'm gonna give the cutting board a rinse. So on the gizzards, when we start doing these later, um, they're slippery, knives are sharp, so you gotta be careful with that. Also, they're full of gravel, really hard on knife blades, so you don't wanna like just try to cut them in half, you can't do that. Um, so I make a cut on the top, and then from there, it's a matter of separating with your fingers. see all the stuff inside the gizzard <laughs> so funny story first time I ever harvested chickens I'm like oh man I can't wait to eat the gizzards so <laughs> I got the whole gizzards you know and I take them in the house and I cook them all up and boil them and do my thing and and I cut into it and I was like holy shit <laughs> learning right you can't regret anything if you learn from it uh, it was the worst gizzard I ever had <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, you know, the good thing is, is I did not lose my appetite to gizzards, but I learned how to clean them. So, you gotta get all the gravel did, did out. Did take a good bite of gravel at first? I did, I just cut it, like the outside, and like, it wasn't like a huge part, yeah. but I was able to cut the outside of it off because it was soft. Um, but there were some little rocks and stuff in there. Yeah, it was disgusting. So there's, now there's this yellow liner. Um, that has to come off. And if you're really lucky, like we have contests when we do this. I don't know where Kristen went, but um, John Youngworth and I used to have contests at gyms. Whoever could get the most gizzards with this yellow piece still intact was, was the best for the winner. And it's possible to get this thing out with all the gravel in it in one whole piece still enclosed. Grand prize is you get to take all the gizzards from your small <laughs> Well, <laughs> or all the gizzards. Because John and I are both huge organ meat people. So, there it is. And then, you know, obviously these... Uh, we need to get more water in this bowl. All, all of them, yeah, they all need to have some water in them. You know, we put all the organs in ice water right now, and then when we go to package everything, they all get a good rinse. We change the water, clean everything off, and then we put the organ meats inside the chickens when we wrap them. And if I know some of my chickens are gonna go to somebody that doesn't eat organ meats, they don't get them, because I don't want them to go in the garbage. You know, I'll feed them to my dog or we'll eat them. That's that. That's that's the process that we're going to go through today. And, you know, we'll have two people here eviscerating their done chickens. Will go on that side. We'll have two here. Their done chickens will go on that side. There's hoses set up for both stations. The tank out here will be where we put the chickens that we scald and pluck. And you know, everybody can just walk in here and grab chickens for eviscerating up here. Um, if you guys have questions at any time, I can stop doing what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm here, so. Yeah, and there are no there are no dumb questions. If you don't know the answer, ask. You know, I think one of the most important things with raising animals for meat and getting people to, to understand day. what we're doing here, a, a lot of it comes in presentation of the animal too, and it shows how much care that you've put into what you're doing in the end. Um, that's one of the reasons I like to have skin flap hanging. And uh, so, like I said, we're not perfect. It's going to be what it is, but. That was, that was how I do it, and if you guys figure out a way that works better for you with the same end result, cool. Maybe you can teach me something too. So, 
I think another important point to make is how we talk about things is important. Um, you know, I've been called out a lot by people in the vegan community, for example, about um, me using the words harvest and process when it comes to taking an animal's life for food. When I hear the words slaughter and butcher, that's a, they, they come with a negative connotation. And I think what I'm doing here is positive. So to differentiate what I do versus what happens on factory farms, uh, I talk about it differently. And I harvest my animals just as I harvest other foods and plants. And, uh, and then I process my animals just like we've been processing tomatoes and processing salsa and canning them and preserving food. Um, so if we can differentiate that, instead of being lumped into one huge category as animal murderers, um, I think it makes a huge difference because what I do is not even close to what happens on factory farms and corporate agriculture. You know, so I think language is important and it's something, it's a discussion that needs to keep happening. And, and I wish I could get more of the people that are anti-meat or anti-taking an animal's life for food to understand that if you're advocating for animal rights, so am I. And that's why I raise the animals the way I do. That's why I harvest them the way I do. That's why I cry every year when I harvest my pigs because it's hard, they become my friends, you know, and because that's how good of a life I give them here. But if, if people could come and witness that, a lot of people have this misconception that any animal that's raised for food is treated poorly. Uh, and, and that it's, you know, got a horrible end of life. Um, but that's not true. You know, it doesn't always go perfect. Nobody's perfect. Um, but I can take an animal's life here, minimizing any stress or anything for the animal, um, and, and it will appear to be humane compared to other things that people have witnessed in documentaries and such. Um, so I, I, think, I think those are really important things. And if I could get more people to come and see that or see it through virtual workshops, for example, um, perhaps they would understand that, man, if we worked together instead of, you know, what Randy's doing is really not that bad. If we could work together, maybe we could then combat factory farming even more. So I'm, I'm sure that there's some things that I forgot to mention or maybe some steps that I didn't explain very well through the process, but uh, there's gonna be a, a Q&A opportunity after this virtual workshop. Once I know when it's gonna be aired, I'm going to be available to people while they're watching the workshop and we can type back and forth and I'll answer questions that way too. Um, but the Q&A live Zoom, I think is gonna be the best opportunity for people and I'll make myself available pretty much anytime for people if they have questions. People can reach out to me on my Facebook page, Shady Grove Farm UP. I'm happy to answer any questions. And if people want to participate in a animal harvest here at our farm, reach out to me and we'll see if we can set that up as well. Like a lot of people probably do just kill an animal and not even think twice about it. But that's why we try to do what we do here to make people think twice about that. So. You know, like I said earlier, it's a it's an emotional roller coaster when it comes to harvest time. Um, none of my animals leave the farm. I do it all all myself with the help of community members and family. And and uh, you know, it's a from start to finish, there has to be the same love, compassion, respect for what it is that we're doing because we're growing these animals. It's not uh, people are like, oh, how do you name them? You know, how do you name your pigs and stuff? And I'm like, these animals deserve to have the best life up until the day that we harvest them. You were not a newbie today, right? No. So you've done this before. Well, how did this go compared to other uh, harvests that you've been through? Really smooth. Yeah. I mean, it was slow to start because, you know, getting documenting, everything, documenting yeah. everything, yeah. but um, everything was really smooth. Yeah. I'm not noticing anything different. It's nice we have a good group of people. Yeah. So it's actually going pretty quick. And this is something that you do on the regular fairly or? Yeah, at least once a year I yeah. come out here. I've been doing, helping Randy and also another farmer, Jim, I help him out uh, or I have in the past. So it's been about 10, no, nine years that I've been helping out with chicken processing. Nice, and what does this sort of experience mean to you? Why do you do it? Well, before I started chicken processing, um, I was a vegetarian for eight years and then I got pregnant. And I said, you know, I'm going to listen to my body. My body was craving meat. I was having dreams about meat. And so I started eating meat again. And my whole 
pro my thought process was the reason I was a vegetarian was because of the environmental impact of meat consumption and factory farming. And I was like, well, if I'm eating meat, my meat's gonna be local. I'm gonna have a close relationship with my meat. I need to know how it was, was raised. I wanna know how it was processed and I wanna be a part of that process. So I contacted Randy when we moved back from California and he's like, well, I'll teach you. I got a lot of chicken processing to do. So I brought, uh, I was pregnant with Atlas at the time. So that's when I learned how to process. And then he's been a part of it since then. And now I have a two and a half year old and she's been a part of it since before birth basically. Um, and it's just, just knowing that, you know, I know exactly how this meat was raised. I know exactly that it, like it lived, this meat lived a good life. These chickens lived a good life till their very last day. And to me that I think that is really important and to know that like local meat is giving back to the community. It gives back to the earth. It's not something that is detrimental to the environment. Um, and, and now we have chickens of our own. This is our second year having meat birds in our backyard. And so I help Randy out, he helps me out. It works out great. I have chickens in my freezer that last my family through the year and until we get our next batch of meat birds every year, so. Well, it sounds like just an all around more nourishing way to nourish yourself. Absolutely, right. and my whole family. And it's interesting because every time I make chicken, my husband's like, is this our, one of our chickens? I'm like, what? why wouldn't it be? <laughs> of course it's our chicken. <laughs> And, and I know that's like, so I know, you know, what I'm feeding my chickens and I, I move my chickens are in a chicken tractor. So I, I move them around every other day. They have fresh grass and they're out in the sun and they're happy chickens. Yeah. I think that it's a really rewarding process. I feel very connected to not just my food, but then also to the earth. And I think that that's always been a big part of what drives what I do is this deeper connection to the earth. So. Oh, thanks for that's why I do what I do. We raised chickens when I was a kid, but my mom didn't even want us to know when they were getting processed and harvested and stuff. So she really kept us out of that. Oh, interesting. Why do you think that was? I think she thought it would freak us out a little. Yeah. Yeah. And so does your inner, your inner child freak out today or did you find it to be just sort of like less anxiety prone? Mm, I've been around other animal harvests and stuff, so. Yeah, it's not really anxiety producing. I feel bad for the chickens, but that's just part of it, I think. Yeah. And I don't think, I think it's weird not to feel bad for an animal like that. And how about you? Oh, first one for chickens in a very long time. I also grew up with farms and so some hands on time, but as a little kid, so zero practical memory of how to do it. Cool. And what is, uh, you know the your personal connection or personal meaning of this kind of uh food production versus other alternatives um i think that it's i think that it's kind of a more responsible way to consume animal products it's i think it's irresponsible and we're kind of our whole food production in society is set up for us all to be irresponsible about it. Like it's it's harder to it's harder to get into that process than it is to just kind of passively consume stuff that was processed in a way that you don't know, or even if you do know, it probably wasn't good. But there just aren't that many options out there for getting your hands into it unless you're honestly ready to commit to the entire process. So I think it's nice to have something like this where you can get exposure to it but i mean we will be doing animals we have done animals before just goats <laughs> we'll so, doing more so animals. that's interesting to me because i've never i mean i've i've hunted deer before but mm -hmm. it's a little bit different you're still disconnected you're part of the process but mm -hmm. um so did you feel a difference in chickens versus a goat something like a goat or maybe it's a little more personal um i think the goats were our animals so it felt personal with the goats, yeah. but we weren't part of the whole slaughter process either. We did, well, we slaughtered them on site, but then the butchering happened off site. Like it happened with a, we sent them to a butcher. So, uh, we didn't have to take them apart. It is hard animals that have names that you care about. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say the, <clears throat> the level of awareness between 
goats and chickens is pretty different as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I've processed hogs and some other stuff. And, and once you get into that kind of intelligence, there's a whole another layer. Um, I guess for me, the reason for doing this, it's a whole bunch of them, but it's a lot more humane. It's more ethical. It's, it's something where the ethics go from the animals to stewardship of land to community. The, the idea, the hope anyway, is that farmers at the scale that are doing it right are able to make the math work so they can make a living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people involved in factory scale farming, unless you own that operation, you're being exploited. Right. Yeah. yeah. And even uh, in vegetable farming too. <clears throat> sure. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like the systems we've, we've designed, you know, have, have gone so far in that direction that you can't possibly, well, I'm not can't possibly, but it's like, if we all started living this way, then it would probably be profitable for everyone to, to do this. It would be, yeah, it's, well, I think there are a couple things like this. Clothing is like this as well, but food is definitely like this. I worked on an organic vegetable farm for a handful of years, and um, we would all start out at minimum wage. And if you stuck around for a couple seasons, it would go up, and they were very transparent about pay structure and stuff. But we would get asked at the farmer's market, like, why the price of things was so high, like, why $4 for a head of lettuce and stuff? And it's like, this is the actual cost. It's because we're getting paid like regular minimum wage, not agricultural minimum wage, which is like two forty an hour. Like servers and agricultural workers, like it's their minimum wage is like still something like two dollars an hour. And um, it hasn't kept up with because of tips and stuff like that. And agricultural workers because they're immigrants and people don't care. But it's like this is the actual cost. You're used to a manipulated costs. You're used to a cost that's been manipulated by exploiting people and exploiting systems. Yes, it's, it's subsidized by almost slave labor. It's subsidized by near slave labor, yeah. And also um, abuse of land and stuff like that with, you know, the pesticides and production practices, monocultures and stuff. Um, yeah, and animals are the same way, of course, you know, it's subsidized. The, co the cost we pay for chicken and beef and the cost we pay for meat is subsidized by exploitation of a lot of humans and a lot of animals. Yeah, so. I, just, I, I want to support this system because I want to still be able to eat decent food in, you know, two, four decades. Yeah. I want my kids, any grandkids to be able to, to eat food that's actually food. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I, I think that there's if you just look around at this farm, it's a small, beautiful operation. The animals are healthy. Mm -hmm. They're living pretty naturally. It doesn't feel like a prison. Yeah, you know, this is a very pleasant spot to be. And I think that there's a there's a connection that comes with that. You know, we've through through time spent spent nights here visiting. We've gotten food from and just shared meals with Randy, Libby, you know, Halatan, and you develop that kind of relationship. They know people from the farmers market, so I think if you're if you're doing business with people that you know, there's another layer of kind of accountability and responsibility there. You know that that's how communities function or die. You know, if everybody's buying their stuff from Walmart, if everything's coming in from somewhere else and it's all this kind of black hole of resource production and accumulation, there are just so many layers to that that kind of dehumanize it. Mm -hmm. And this, this I think is the only sustainable way forward. I think it's something that people should have an understanding of if they're going to eat meat and if they have the opportunity to participate in the harvest and you know the process in some level you know the care or the harvest the animals or something like that i think it's worthwhile i think even absent the opportunity to be hands-on yourself supporting small sustainable you know humane agriculture 
via farmers markets or uh, CSA community supported agriculture, these kinds of things, you can keep this happening in your area. One of my greatest fears is if there's some breakdown in our logistics in our food supply chains, where, where do you get food if the only place within you know, X number of miles that you can't travel outside of is a grocery store and they can't get it, what do you do? You know, I, there are, you were talking about freezers and such, there are a lot of really old technologies for storing food as well. So, you know, a lot of this can be pretty simple. And push for Right to Farm Act, push for people being able to be legally moving towards self-reliance and self-sufficiency, whether that's the family level or community level. Uh, I want people to be able to take care of themselves and each other. Mm -hmm. This is certainly a piece of that. Yeah, it's funny. The conversation can kind of go like... Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's it's a spider web. Because it's like... Yeah, it's put right to come. Also like... Wages in your area. You know, yeah, yeah. Wages need to go up. Representation in local government. And, yeah, it's funny because it, know, it all ties back to... I was having a conversation blocks. with a friend of mine the other day about the American dream, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the <laughs> corporate version of that and how difficult it is to actually be a part of that anymore mm -hmm. unless you were born into a certain wealth bracket. Yes. And everyone else is sort of like chasing what the American dream is in the, as defined by corporate yeah. America. Uh, I don't want that dream. In many ways, this is the American dream. Right. Yeah, this makes, <laughs> yeah, this is a lot right. more appealing. Yeah. This is wealth and freedom. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's community. People... Most people, in my opinion, want to exist in a community and exist in that community in such a way that they are contributing to the betterment of themselves and everyone around them. That's fundamentally what we're wired for. You know, this is a beautiful way to do that.